the precursor to revival. This is absolutely a prerequisite. You could say the prerequisite to revival, repentance. You know what's interesting to me is that Jesus um, himself, in preaching his first message, in the book of Matthew chapter 4, his first message was on the subject of repentance. Guess who else? John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3. Check it out. First message he ever preached was on repentance. Pastor, what in the world does repentance mean? Well, it's a change of mind. It's a change of heart about my sin. And the reality is, even though we're, we're believers, probably most people that are viewing this um, discipleship uh, project are believers. If you're not a believer, you need to come to faith in Jesus and experience initial repentance. But Martin Luther said this. He said, we're going to be repenting all the way to the gate. The responsibility that we have to deal with our sin. Uh, you know, I'm a pastor. I, I am, uh, have been serving the church that, uh, that I'm serving now, almost finished, for 37 years. And I still deal regularly with challenges and sins and struggles in my own life. And so do you. No one is exempt. So what does the Bible have to say about it? Well, I want you to go with me to James 1, verse 14 and 15. I've memorized these verses, and I just want to walk you through the acknowledgement of our need for repentance and then share just briefly what we've seen. I want you to imagine with me hundreds of young people just a few months ago, just a few weeks ago, uh, pouring down an aisle into an altar with a card in their hand to repent, turn from their sin, broken about it, you know, a true believer is not happy about their sin. They're not happy to carry it. And then I remember us going down to the fire pit at this particular camp and watching the students come out of the building by the hundreds, broken over their sin and dropping the card with their sins listed into a fire. Maybe right now you want to get something to write with. It may be God speaks to your heart about something during this session. If so, I would challenge you to bring those sins before God and turn from them today. James 1, 14 and 15, listen to this verse. You know it well. The Bible says, But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. I saw two or three principles in this. Number one, I want you to see the truth. Every, the Bible says, every man is tempted. That means every person is tempted. Every woman is tempted. There's nobody that, that makes it through this life that doesn't experience temptation or a solicitation to do evil. The enemy is going to make sure of that. Your flesh is going to lend itself to that. So the truth is, every person is tempted. Maybe you're thinking, hey, I, I'm, uh, I've overcome that. No, you haven't. Be honest with yourself. Remember, it starts with honesty, then humility. And then the Holy Spirit will reveal to you your need to repent. Number one, the truth, every man is tempted. Number two, notice the test. When he or she is drawn away of their own lusts and enticed. Do you know what lust means? It means desires. And did you know what? As many people as will view this project, there are probably as many different desires. We're all so different. You know what? I'm never tempted in your area of desire, in your area of wants and longings. You see, you're different than me, but I have my own. And I'm tempted in my... The enemy's pretty smart. He hears what we say. He doesn't know our heart. He's not omniscient. But he, he does hear what we say, and he sees what we look at. And so therefore, we find ourselves being tempted in the area where we're weak. The third thing in the text, very interesting to me, is the trap. Listen to this. Every man is tempted. That's the truth. When he or she is drawn away of their own lust and enticed, everybody's tempted to sin. But the temptation is not the sin. When we yield to it, listen to the trap. You ever set a trap for maybe a, a bird or an animal? When they get inside, they trip it, and then the trap is, is closed. It's set. The trap is this. Every man is tempted when he's drawn of his own, away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, when those desires, then you act on them. You yield to them. And we all do this. When lust hath conceived, listen to this, it bringeth forth sin. You know, I, I think about all the times when I have a thought that I shouldn't have, and I entertain that thought. You know, the immediate thought's not the sin, but then well, what happens is I linger in that thought, or I get angry, and instead of thinking something and not speaking it, I just speak it and hurt someone. You see, lust, at that point, my desire is conceived, and I fall into the trap. And here's what's dangerous. This is what I say to students, and I'll say it to adults and everybody else all the time. Churches, listen to this. 
Then it begins a cycle. When lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. You then stay in a cycle. You think, Lord, forgive me for this. I know this is wrong. But then it comes right back again because you haven't dealt with it. And you end up in that cycle of sin and wondering, am I ever going to be able to break this cycle? And the answer is no, you're not going to. Only Jesus, through the power of His resurrection, will ever break that cycle. And we're talking about repentance. So what's the next part of this text? I'm almost done. First, there's the truth. Every man is tempted. Secondly, there is the test, when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then the trap. Then when lust hath conceived, you do it. Number four, the tragedy brings forth death. You know, I see it all the time. Churches are dead. Many churches, there, there was life there in years gone by. And now it's dry and barren. And there's no joy or passion. I see this in the life of individuals and students and families. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Sin happened. And they didn't repent. When lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Hey, death to a marriage. Death to a relationship. Death to an opportunity. Death to your potential. Hey, that's not where you want to be. So what's the answer, Pastor? Well, the answer is very simple. You know what the answer is? It's repentance. I was coming across a, a truth in Revelation 3, verse 20. You know the verse, I, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door. I, I've always struggled with the interpretation of that phrase until I looked at the previous verse. I'm very convinced that the opening of that door is repentance. I then remembered that verse where, uh, where in the Scriptures we're told, the Holy Spirit gives it to John to write down, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. That's salvation, our sins. But He didn't stop there, did He? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, when you got saved, Jesus knew you would fail. He knew I would fail. That's why He went to the cross. And this repentance process needs to be happening on and on in our lives. It was 1995, Coggin Avenue Baptist Church, and they had no idea when God started moving that morning that this would influence college campuses up and down the southeastern seaboard, all the way to Liberty University and a lot of other places. But what happened was genuine repentance. Students started getting right with God. And you know what they did? They set a microphone up in the middle of that large auditorium at uh, Howard Payne University in Texas, and the young people started coming one after the other and testifying of their sin and apologizing, then getting in an altar and broken, weeping before God. After that happened, the wind of heaven began to blow, and it'll happen in your life if you will repent of your sin. You say, Pastor, what are some sins, some current sins? Let me just mention a few of them. Anger, wrath, malice, filthy communication coming out of your mouth, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, fear, entitlement, ingratitude, people-pleasing, prayerlessness, hypocrisy, rebellion, anger, superiority, insecurities. All these are a part of the root of sin, which is pride. And friend, if you'll ask God to reveal in your heart those things that aren't right, He will show you. And then you can come before Him. And on the merits of what He did on the cross, you can say, God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me and restore to me the joy of my salvation and revive my heart. He'll do it. It's a precursor, a prerequisite to revival, repentance. Repentance. 